Well, good day. And uh, Tom Barnett, thank you very much for joining me in this conversation. And um, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Kat. Um, I wanted to just give a little bit of a, a seating about what is going to take place. Um, I'm a holistic um, healthcare practitioner, as is Tom. Tom is in Australia. I'm in New Mexico. And um, I've been writing a book, uh, which is called The uh, Women's Worth, Man's Worth, The Overfed Body, The Underfed Soul. I've been working on that since about 2012, and I didn't realize just how potently um, profound uh, that title would be uh, as we head today into what some are uh, looking at as being uh, this move to transhumanism and AI. And I, um, I began to see back in those early, uh, early parts of 2000 that there was a real attack against our men. Uh, I was noting it particularly from an environmental perspective. And then also realizing, well, of course, all the warring, uh, because this country in and of itself has about 226 years of 238 years of being a country in war with our men as cannon fodder, uh, our young, most, you know, most vital um, men. And, um, and, and, and then of course, as I've been delving more recently, I realized that this, this attack against our, about, uh, against humanity over these last couple of years uh, really is focused so strongly against our men and leaving the women and the children vulnerable. And so, Tom, I wanted to ask you if you could maybe introduce yourself and then we can begin a conversation on that subject. And welcome again. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, sure. So I'm also a holistic health practitioner. My role is mostly in bringing people back into balance in the physical, mental, emotional and spiritual aspects in order to recover from whether it's an illness or an injury or anything to that effect. And also more recently, I've been helping people learn more about their rights from a legal perspective as well. So that's, that's my role as my work. Uh, and then as a man in society, I've grown up seeing a lot of what you're speaking about. So from childhood through my work through martial arts and security work. And as a, as a practitioner, I've dealt a lot with the ways in which we all are, um, kind of brought down and reduced our power to a certain degree. Very good. So um, Tom, I wonder where you might want to start. Would you want to start on the spiritual side, on the physical side, the you know, environmental side, or I'm going to leave that open to you and please take whatever beginning is the most passionate for you and, and we'll go from there. Okay, I think the physical and the environmental is the easiest to start with because it's the element that most is right in front of everybody's eyes. So it'll be the easiest to kind of you know get a feel for before we go into anything that of a higher nature. So, do you, would you like to start with as far as where things might have started to go wrong or what we're dealing with currently? What's the how would you well, like to start? I, I think it would be a great idea to start with the environmental, as you were suggesting, um, and and maybe some historical uh, sit, situating as terms of when the environmental aspects really started showing uh yeah. and and building perhaps sure so for me that started with the advent of colonialization so every land on earth essentially had its own law law being l-o-r-e it had its own customs its own uh, practices and its own way of keeping things in check amongst the you know people living but also in communion with nature everything was basically modeled off of nature's laws. Then with the advent of colonialization and wanting to take this new way of being, which was going, taking things from a intuitive and an in tune perspective to trying to really uh, bring things to a man-made perspective for the pursuit of money and profit and power, then that's when things started to change environmentally. So that means that uh, we changed the, the physical structure of things uh, around us. And we also change the societal structure of things around us as well. That also led to the production of 
Uh, well, the overproduction and the overworking of the individual. So because of the, um, you know, because of the, what would you call it? I'd call it the currency or the uh, commodity of man, essentially. It's labor was used to make this and slave labor at that. So energy is not created or destroyed, it's transmuted. So people, I believe, were using our energy to then feed them by essentially using up what we have as a resource. And so that became what we have today, which began building cities and agriculture business and uh, the industrialization. And with that, the other change in the environment became an elevated level of stress that permeates the environment, not just from our stress of what we're put under, but uh, the toxicity. So electromagnetic smog has increased year after year and the amount of chemicals sprayed in the environment and uh, everything to that effect. So the environment to me changed once this colonialization or the colonial mind began to infect the earth. And then everything we see now is a result of that. Yes, and, and, and so in terms of the environmental chemical exposures, are there any in particular that you're seeing that, um, that are a direct attack on men? I have my own experiences and perspectives, so I'd be curious and interested to hear yours. Sure. I, to me, it's the toxic metallic minerals. So anytime there's heavy metals spread, anything from uh, you know aluminium, barium, strontium, uh, mercury, not just sprayed, but just introduced to the environment uh, in many different ways and introduced to our bodies through medications and vaccines and uh, many other factors. Those weaken those weaken the system on many levels. They also bring down the, essentially what they do is they downregulate the power structure within our own bodies. So what the system has done is it's introduced the idea of force. It forces things. It forces us to do things and it requires us to use it or to exert our own level of force into the world around us in order to function within the system created. The opposite of that being power which has its own innate ease of energy that is far superior to force, but we've gone into this force continuum. And so when we get down regulated in our own systems, because we have chemical exposure, anything to do with a heavy metal or toxic metallic mineral binds to the receptor sites in the body, which means that the hormonal and uh, enzyme functions in the body don't have anything to latch onto because those receptor sites are full of these toxic metallic minerals. So that means everything from, uh, especially testosterone. And, uh, and I mean, if you look at the levels of testosterone in men today, it's far below what it should be on average. Fertility rates are dropped well below what they should be. And that's no mistake. That's as a result of a well-designed uh, poisoning system, but also the poisoning of the mind when men actually willingly accept some of this new this new way and don't look after themselves to the degree that they should. And so that's where we see a lot of, uh, you know, the resulting uh, demasculation and the taking of the power of men in society is partly, uh, partly it's chemical environmental, which we don't have a lot of say over, but that leads in itself to compliance because when you downregulate a man's hormonal system and his ability to connect to his inner power, you also make him more subservient. So he becomes more, I don't want to say effeminate, but he just, he becomes more compliant. He's less likely to just stand his ground in his own power because he's been led to be on the internet too much or be using pornography or be eating junk foods or whatever, anything that reduces his power as a man, uh, he's actually willingly entering into. Very, very fine and, and, and so apt. and. Of course, you know, men define themselves so much with what they accomplish, their, their work. And so when livelihoods are destroyed is what we've seen during this last year and a half, where the entrepreneurial opportunities have been squashed and, and, and so many, you know, so employment is, is taken away. And that's been throughout history. I mean, in this country, 
the first corporation was in the middle 1800s with the railroad, but it took away dreams and it took away opportunities. And so there were addictions that were um, easily latched onto because we need joy. As human beings, we need joy. And so these, these false um, reproductions of joy through various chemicals um, could give that to a human being, which is necessary for us to go forward in life. Um, can you talk maybe a little bit about your experience of, with, um, you know, around addictions and and um, and and what you've seen there in terms of the the impacts. Well, men have a tendency towards addiction when they have something in them that they've not resolved or found some pattern or story that's running that they're not able that's not conscious yet and it's it's essentially driving their behavior and when they have this rift of understanding or rift of uh, a non-centering or a non-unification of who and what they are then they can well women too but that's how it happens to men most often is then they develop addictive behaviors whether it's for food alcohol drugs sex pornography gambling uh, any of the common you know uh, uh, addictions and a lot of it is, you know, it is a self-defeating or a self-defeating uh, cycle, you know. So when we come to, I guess, asking the question of where it comes from, it really, to me, comes from being taken away from our power from the very beginning, from birth, from being born into a sterile environment, from being, you know, uh, back in the day, as you mentioned earlier, uh, being circumcised and having a lot of elements of our nature being taken away from growing up, believing that it, we need to hide or mute our masculine power because it's offensive or it's uh, abusive or something to that effect. And of course it can, it can manifest in that kind of behavior. It can be abusive and it can be, uh, you know, it can trample things, but it's not by its own nature. And I think that sometimes it's in the confusion of the nature that then it becomes that what's referred to as toxic masculinity. That's what it becomes when it's not actually understood in the first place of what that power actually is. So I believe that through societal conditioning, through our educational or indoctrination system, we become very confused uh, as men. We don't have a rite of passage nor do women, but at least women have a biological rite of passage because when she first bleeds, she's essentially becoming a woman. Whereas for a man, there's not really the same biological. I mean, there's a, a man gets to the stage where he can uh, ejaculate, for example, but that's not necessarily, that's not tempered, that's not honored, that's not celebrated in any way. And quite often it's taken and then taken into something like pornography or something like that, where a boy is now wasting his power and potential because it's not being recognized or nurtured or celebrated and it's not directed like the masculine energy is like a laser it's very strongly focused and directed at something and without that it can fragment and so men can become fragmented and in that state of loss like who am i what am i i don't feel like a harmonious unified being then it can lead to reaching for other things to fill what is missing which is the addictive behaviors and personalities. Mm -hmm. um, when, um, when addictions were first, really, from what I've read, they've, they've been introduced because alcohol was not something that was considered uh, an addictive issue. Alcohol was used in a celebration and it was, and it was not over abused culturally in, in the past. It was, um, it was something that um, was a, a, a part of, of a festivity, but it wasn't an ongoing abuse. And the same thing with, with, with drugs that I've seen that they've been introduced into societies, drugs and pornography for destabilization reasons, to destabilize countries. Um, and uh, we saw that happening in Germany. Um, of course, we've seen that also in this country. Uh, and um, you know, in, in the late 1800s, the Sassoon uh, family introduced opium 
into China. And China was a very stable country for thousands of years with tremendous history and culture. And, and, and it really, it really destabilized that country with the opium dens. And, and then of course, opium was introduced into this country about the same time. And so all of those things were, you know, were accepted um, introductions, which I find very interesting because there hasn't been a, a big pushback. In fact, it's been introduced and accepted by the cultures. Um, so do you have any, any further thoughts on that? Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. If you're right, it's been manufactured that way. But one of the ways that that was able to be put in place is that you need to take away the original source of what that's replacing. And that was the elders. That was the leadership in men. That was the strong men of society and replaced it with things like pop culture, looking up to movie stars, musicians, teenagers, like a lot of teenagers are raised by teenagers on TikTok and Instagram and, and things like that. Without, I mean, with, with a strong masculine presence in place from elders, that sort of stuff is irrelevant because it's just such a hollow, shallow, pitiful uh, energy to be associated with when you can look up to something so strong and resonant and follow in that, that path, you know, those footsteps. So without that, without that presence in society, it's so easy for, for people to be waylaid and, and put into any kind of, you know, anything that is offered by society, but it wouldn't be there because the drugs, for example, or the abuse of alcohol or pornography with strong masculine presence within the tribe or the community, it would lead it away from that. It would be inspiring that it would be taught for what it is to see it for what it is. And then not just that, because showing what something is when it's a negative is one thing, but then inspiring with the power of what the, the, um, an alternative, an alternative is, you know, do you want that because that's what it's made of, or do you want this, you know, this real sense of power that is so much more fulfilling and not just words either, not just blah, 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 but you can see it in them. You can see, I see that power because it's, it's present and it's obvious. And then that's inspiring like it with children you know you can't just be a sloth on the couch and go kids you should be playing sport you've got to do this unless you do 10 push-ups a day you don't get dinner it's not really how it works a kid wants to see dad out there doing push-ups and then the kid goes i want to do what dad's doing there's no asking them to exercise because they they're inspired by what you do or we do and so uh that's where we've that's why these elements of uh, these distractions have been able to be put in place because the power structure just got dismantled and then this got fed in. Do you have a, do you have a sense of how that power structure um, became dismantled and, and how, how we have, in essence, been devolving over the last many decades? Do you have a, a sense? Can you speak to that? Yeah, well, I've got a sense. I don't know for sure. And but my sense is that it came from, first of all, force and poison. It came from poisoning of the mind. So when the colonial mind first took by force, uh, you know, native lands like in America, like in Australia, like in Canada and all the Commonwealth countries, uh, what was offered was something better. And for whatever reason, every indigenous culture seemed to willingly at to some degree. Now I'll give the op op opposing view to that in a second, but to some degree saw the white man as something superior. They brought with them something they hadn't see, seen. So when you see a majestic ship, when you see a musket or a firearm, when you see weaponry or something you haven't seen before, you might very well assume that they are more advanced, that they are bringing something new. And so the mind can easily be poisoned where you give away that power in return for what you think is going to be better. And that goes back to biblical text of, of uh, you know, giving away, taking the, the apple off the tree or taking the whatever. It's like the, the temptation and you give into that thinking you're going to get something better in return, but essentially you gave away what you really had in the first place, which was the more powerful thing. Now, the opposite to that, well, not the opposing view, but what also went along with that was pure force and bloodshed. Mm -hmm. And when that happens from a large force and a large occupying force that, that brutalizes, 
a native culture, it can take the heart out of the culture and um, it will never be forgiven or forgotten. It still is there in the memory, but, it, but there's that element of possession is nine tenths of the law. And so if, if somebody decides that they want your or my house and they're a gang and they got 20 people in their gang and we're in the house by ourselves, doesn't, it doesn't matter if we consent or not, they're going to take the house. There's no two ways about that. So there's that element too, where it was just through sheer brutality and bloodshed that they dismantled that power structure. And so as, the, as time goes on, we get used to that and, and we continue to play into it. And I believe it's, it's my sense that the main tool for that was money. Because when money was introduced in the way that we know it into societies, it gave the impression that you could have more for less and that you could essentially borrow on a future. Whereas that never happened before. Every decision made in the present moment, especially Native American culture, for example, was seven years past and seven years into the future. How will this decision now affect that? And every Native culture has something similar. But that got lost with the, with the prospect of money where you could just make things happen based on this uh, fictitious currency. And that's where I think the power structure became diminished because it actually went to the weakness in a man where he could have more for less and have something now based on an on a imaginary future. And so part of it was the offer, part of it was forced, but part of it was our own undoing because we hadn't realized that aspect. And I actually think that we're about to come back to a full circle loop where we're closing off that mistake, where we've realized you can't, there's no amount of money in the world that can actually buy back what you actually had. So then we therefore take it back. It's a consent thing. We take back that power. And that's what I see happening at the moment in the world. Very, very well spoken. And, and of course, you know, the commodification of everything and, and putting a money value on everything, even on human life. I think a human life is worth $250,000 in the court system. And of course, you know, I mean, that's laughable because how do you commoditize a human life? Well, you do in a system that has no value of life. And, and so what we're seeing today is that we're fighting for our lives and, and, and there isn't any amount of money that is worth what we're seeing is being lost. And you know, like you were you know, talking about the value of, of, you know, of, of, um, of money, this fiat money that continues to become devalued the inflationary aspects of, of the fiat currency right now is skyrocketing. And so our value is in ourselves, the land, growing food, uh, our relationships to one another, um, the emotional relationships of love and our own self-worth. And, um, and, and those things can't be commoditized and they can't be taken away from us. So as long as we um, recognize our own intrinsic value and that of others who recognize their intrinsic value, we are very strong. That sovereign na nature of us is indomitable. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we're taught. That's what natural law is about. And that's what we've moved away from and we've forgotten to a degree. And I say this a lot, it's not about learning anything new. We don't have to learn anything new at all to come back to that. We just have to remember what we've lost, remember who we are. And part of that is an education for sure, because it can come back to our rights and come back to natural law and to recognize it, not necessarily learn so much new stuff, but to recognize what it is, what already is, but we just have to reclaim. And, uh, you know, uh, I mean, fiat currency is relatively new. I mean, the original money was gold and silver coin. But what happens is that, I mean, that's tangible and that has real value. But at the same time, it can create the slave system. Because if somebody can have it, then somebody else can't. And that's the, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, it's like Ubuntu. It's an African principle where unless everybody in the community can have something, then why would I want something if not if no, if no one else has it? And so it's a, an equal sharing, which is a really, 
it's the op it's not communism but it's it's a very much a shared mentality as soon as somebody says yes to money yes i want 20 gold and silver coins you can only have that because other people can't and it creates that top down system it creates people with wealth and people and the slaves that give to the people with wealth and that's that's what creates it so that's where the heart of man became corrupted was with accepting money and then again the opposite side of the story is for those that knew that and said no to it then war was declared on them and when they didn't have enough numbers to fight back they got decimated so it's not necessarily the fault of people sometimes sometimes i guess men knew that but then if there was no other choice in order to protect their their family rather than go well kill us all in instead because you're never taking our freedoms they said well i want to see my wife and my children live on so i'll accept the money you know there's a, and that's that's honorable in a way as well because it's not necessarily selling out because it's to protect you know the those that can't protect themselves so there's many elements i can't speak to directly because i wasn't there you know <laughs> we in hindsight you could say what people should and shouldn't have done or what did and didn't happen but we weren't really there to observe it and most of history is corrupted so we don't know for sure, but that's my estimation of how, you know, what led to today. And the consent part can be brought back at any time because we can, with our choices, with our choices, we can turn that around. For example, a bank lends money, lends fiat currency, which is fictitious, and they lend it on a fractional basis, which means that they don't need anything to begin with. They can make it up out of thin air. So that creates a slave system because it creates a massive discrepancy between those that have and those that don't have the full bellies and the empty bellies. Now, the element of that that is might surprise some people is that's not necessarily evil because they don't put a gun to anyone's head and say, hey, go take out a mortgage and buy a two million dollar house. They don't do that. They offer it. And we as a weak, the weak part in us, not the we're weak, but the weak part of us thinks that that's a good idea and says yes. And it willingly takes that, not by under duress, not by force, it willingly accepts that and says yes to it. And when we say yes to that, we say no to having rights and freedoms. It's, we can't have it both ways. And so, the time we're in now and reclaiming that is a matter of saying yes to what really counts and yes to our true power and not continuing to accept willingly consent to the slave system that is being created. Well, you know, as you say that, it makes me think of a number of things, you know, I think as a as human beings are, you know, inherently trusting and, and, and with trust, um, we love and we connect and we we experience the joys of of life. I mean, of course, life is a wave. It, it, it it's a full range of emotional experiences. But but underneath all of that, in order to truly be loving and have relationships, and everything about living is relationship. Whether it's to our 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 meadows or our forests or our, our streams and oceans and you know the the birds and whatever but but i think there's an element of deception that's in all of this having to do with with money the whole central banking system was deceptive the federal reserve system in this country was totally deceptive you know to be able to print money out of thin air and yet and yet it was interfaced with with society with people who are basically trusting and good. So there's an evil part and a deceptive part. And I, I see that kind of parasitic element throughout all of this, because we inherently are very wise people. You know, we, our, our ancestors were wise. They, they, they brought forward um, us, we're wise people. You know, people, people are, and they fought for us. And so to have a system that preys upon, in a sense, our, our innocence, because trusting, we, we have to be innocent to trust because there's so many pitfalls. So, so um, I, I, I believe that there has been something rather demented that has actually interfered with our ability to 
to evolve as, as human beings in our cultures and that our history has been removed from us. It's being wiped off. It's being, it's being annihilated. And, and that gives us a very unstable foundation because if we don't understand from where we come, then how do we springboard off of that? And, and, and what, what, do we, what do we do? Like today, there's a lot of confusion. People don't really understand what is truly happening. So how can they, how can they springboard off and stand as a warrior or stand as in their in their full sovereignty and their rights? So can you that that's a rather yeah, thing well, to say, but please go for it. What a great question. <laughs> it's such it's it's a big one. And to go back to where, where you started with that, you're right. It was an innocence and a trust and a genuine love that a lot of cultures that were taken over that's how they were taken over. It's because they welcomed in. Some of them saw the white men as gods and some of them were just, hey, you're, uh, you're a guest, welcome. Yeah. You know, we'll share, we'll share our land and our, and our food with you. And it came from a pure sense of love and trust. And so part of the evolution of man is to have that experience because I think we need to have that experience in order to learn from it. So it was nobody's fault and there was nothing. And honestly, from a, being outside of the ego perspective of what should and shouldn't have happened and what was bad and what was good or right, it's, it's a great experience because the collective evolution learns from that and has wisdom from that. And we're moving through that now because we're, we're coming to the stage coming out of the innocence. And we're coming to the stage where we say, okay, well, it was innocence that got us here in the first place to a degree or ignorance or whatever you want to call it. There's lots of different ways you can look at it. And there's that part of us though, that then has to recognize, well, we can still be open and we can still be loving and we can still maintain our innocence. We don't have to harden and close that off, but we do need to realize what was taken advantage of. And in some cases, what was taken advantage of is our good nature and giving away, giving away too much, and and uh, not being discerning enough, and not uh, and not questioning, and then also though uh, I think more than anything is uh, believing that there's better than what we have now. The grass is greener. That aspect I think that got taken advantage of as well. So lots, a lot of different elements to it. I can't say that I'm going to pinpoint any particular one, but I think our collective evolution now is coming to the stage where we need to realize that the responsibility of all things lies with us. It doesn't come from an external thing or a new technology that's coming in and it's going to make life better because that doesn't exist. And hopefully through the experiences we've had of losing cultures and losing history and losing people and lives, we can realize now that that's never the right, that's never the path. It's not going to come as an answer as something external. And it can only come from that internal part. And so with that, we find what your original question is, is why is, has man been dulled down? And I believe the reason is that for us to come to this realization, because it was always going to come out, you can't hide a lie. You can't hide you know, the, the reserve banking system. We didn't know what it was in the beginning but we were always going to find out because you can't hide that stuff and they know it's going to come out. Right. So knowing ahead of time that it will come out, you want to make sure that the time you have before people figure it out, you weaken their resolve to the point that when they do find out, they don't come and just drag you out because they're no longer strong, united culture and men and beings. And so that to me is the plan. Uh, do I know that for sure? No, it's just something that I, that's my estimation of how things have come about. So now that we are at this point in, in evolution, we need to find what that real power is. And it's not necessarily in a physical sense. I don't believe that we are, because that's just repeating past cycles of going, well, okay, let's collectively get together as brothers in arms and take arms and uh, let's fight. You know, there's, there may always be a place for that. But I believe that the current time is more it's a it's a coming into our hearts and coming into our true power more than it's about a physical force, meeting force with force. I'm not sure that that's the answer moving forward. 
Well, that's that's an interesting perspective. And so I then I wonder, <clears throat> because I, I look at it from from the environmental perspective, the introduction of uh, synthetic estrogens has had a ravaging impact on our men. Um, so all of the herbicides and pesticides are estrogenic based. And what that does is it competes with the testosterone and it, it lowers the testosterone, but it overwhelms the male, the male body, the physicality of the male body. And then, and, and, and when that happens, there's a physical change in that man, the actual structure. So, uh, I mean, men develop women's hips and, and, and thighs and stomachs and bottoms and, 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 um, and, it, and, and, and women, women or male breasts. And that's becoming a very common occurrence all across the world. And, and then of course, you know, the, the ubiquitous use of marijuana, Canada, Prime Minister Trudeau legalized marijuana use in across Canada. I'm not against the use of marijuana, but I've always been against the cross legalization of it because I've seen what is taking place. Um, not only does it dull the spirit of that man, but it increases the estrogenic uh, uh, flood in the body and it creates breast tissue. And that's where we see all these men with man boobs. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a very serious situation because, because it's not just a, a psychological change, it's a real physical change. And so at a time when we need our men, maybe we don't want them, need them out there with, with, the, with the guns, but we need them feeling empowered. And how can a man who has women's breasts and hips and thighs and stomach feel empowered as a man. I, I mean. Totally. Yep, I agree. And it's, I mean, it's more than that as well. The estrogenic uh, compounds or xenoestrogens are everywhere. It's in even inks and dyes. It's in the food supply. It's where, what, get, I don't want to like criticize people's food choices at all, but the vegan, uh, the vegan movement is actually designed to do just that as well. Really? Too many soy based. Oh yes. Too many, too many like artificial uh, foods that are, you know, soy based, for example, that, that is estrogenic as well. So it, there's a lot, it comes at us from every angle. And so, and you're exactly right. It's, and I hear it all the time. I hear it from men saying, where's the men? And I hear from women saying, where are the men? You know, and it's, and it's true because at a time when men should be actually standing up against the tyranny that we're seeing now, there's, they're few and far between and it's worrying. That's, that, that's the question that everybody's asking, where are the men? <laughs> it's uh, not, not good. Well, it, it's true. And, and, you know, there's a reason that there's been this attack against our men just for this very reason that, that you pointed out as well is right at a time when we need the men to stand up and protect their, their, not inclined to their capacity to their knowing to they've been just you know impacted psychologically their 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 purpose in life has been basically removed and then of course with all these environmental exposures including the water with all of the the chemicals in it and um you know we have antidepressants and birth control pills and, 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 and everything in our water supplies that are municipal waters. And so that's also heavily burdening the body with all these toxins. So if we don't make proper choices, if we aren't educated about what it is that is assaulting our men and our women, but our men, because they're the frontliners, then we, are destroyed as a, as a, as, as a, as a society. Um, the infertility rates among men are very low, but not just that, the erectile dysfunction rates are soaring. And, and we can look at it from a number of different perspectives. One wearing cell phones in one's pockets, right or left, those mm -hmm. microwave frequencies are actually altering our own frequencies. Do you do you see that occurring? And could you speak to that? 
Yeah, I do. Yeah. Look, I'll be honest though. I'm in a very fortunate part of the world where most people here, not a large proportion of people live a natural way of life. And I don't see as much of that, but it's like, if I go to a regional place and I walk through a shopping center, that's where I see what you're describing. I see the, the feminized men. I see, you know, people who are just not, they're not human anymore. Basically they don't have the characteristics of, of a fully alive human. They're in, you can tell they're infertile. You can feel it. You don't even have to test them. And so it is playing way too much into that. But again, we were offered phones. We were offered alternative foods. We were offered, you know, all of this. And we, and we took it, not all of us, but, some, but enough of us took it. So I guess really the question now is how to get back to it, because it isn't just a erectile dysfunction, for example, can be something as simple as stress. A man is exerting him to himself too much to work 80 hours a week to feed his family. So it's coming from a good place. It's not just that he's drank the Kool-Aid and he's, he's uh, having too much soy and, and you sticking his phones in his pockets. It might just be that he's overstressing himself just to keep up in a modern world and that can lead to erectile dysfunction just by itself you know and then well everything else we've spoken about on top of that but what's the solution well the solution is really getting back to nature and our and our nature and i think men need to see more men in order to be inspired by that i really do i think that men always have a hierarchical structure you have the alpha the beta, the delta, the gamma, the sigma, whatever. To be honest, I don't even know what they all mean. <laughs> but I know that there's a hierarchical structure in any primate in the animal kingdom. There's a hierarchical structure. So those men that have lost their way need to see men being men. And they need to recognize themselves in them and go, ah, I remember I, part of that I remember. And then they need to do things that men do. They need to, they need to build things. They need to use their hands. They need to get off the computer and stop doing living a weak lifestyle and they need to get out and be men and uh, toil and love. But part of it is not just a strength. It's the strength to open your heart to all things. That's the other side of it. So, but before then it's like, get in the gym, lift some weights, go and run, do something that is going to increase your testosterone, get some more solid foods in the diet, like animal foods, for example, You've got to do things that actually lead to an anabolic state in your body. Something that just gets your testosterone moving and shifts that estrogenic imbalance. And then through thoughts, through lifestyle, through diet, through your sleep wake patterns, through uh, moving your body correctly and through opening your heart, then you can reclaim your masculinity as a man and the power that lies within it. But I believe that a lot of men at the moment need to see that in other men to get that inspiration. And what do we see? We see anybody that's doing this sort of stuff, getting their channels deleted if it's just on the internet or, uh, you know, like the, the men that people are putting up with the system is putting up as the men in society. They're like women, they're f effeminate men like Trudeau, for example, he's a really effeminate kind of a man. Most politicians are, you don't get manly men. And then anybody that's like, you know, uh, being a manly man gets criticized and then pulled down by a feminist movement, for example. They're like, oh, you know, everything is like slandering the power of a man. So we need to look beyond that and find what, what really is. And then for men not to be discouraged by that either, because that's a weakness in itself. So let be what will be, but don't lose sight of what we are and what the message is. And then people will be inspired. People will you know, it doesn't, the internet's great. Look, I think it's got its place, but what's more important to me than doing interviews is how I conduct myself in society around other men and around the young men, those that are just growing up. Is there enough in me? And am I carrying enough for them to go, I want to be more like that guy than I want to be on my TikTok and Instagram? Because if not, they're going to go that way. And if not, then I'm not being enough of a role model. And then that's my responsibility. It's not, oh, the government's doing this and, and there, people are feminizing men. It's not necessarily that. It's I'm not being strong enough. So it makes, it makes the men who know what's going on even more responsible for what they're doing and carrying into the world. Exactly. Very well said. When, when I, uh, my dear friend um, sent me your link and I began listening to you and it was apparent to me immediately that you were a man. 
a strong man, a warrior, a, a, a man who had sovereignty and, and self-confidence and, and it came across. And I, I was so grateful to, to discover you where you are and to hear that you really recognize and understand how important it is for you to be who you are as an example to other men. And, and that's really where these, these interviews that I'm doing about the destruction of our men, why it's so important to have you speaking because, because there, there, is a, there is a real bifurcation here. But this division between the sexes has been insidiously put in place. It's been planned. There's mind control. A Tavistock Institute um, brought in sex, drugs, and rock and roll into the United States to divert a whole generation of people. The New Age was also a Tavistock and MK Ultra CIA instigation. Everything and anything was in, infiltrated. There was nothing sacred left for us. And we didn't realize that there was an insidious divide and conquer between the sexes. The feminist movement was also a complete mind control CIA invention to, to separate the sexes, to, to bring out the anger, to, to basically put men into a crisis and, 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 and put women into ardent postures so that they warred against their man. And so there's a responsibility here for the women, for us to recognize our femininity, to recognize our own part in this. Because if we can't accept and receive our men, then we, we cannot be a part of the solution. And that sacredness of the union between a man and a woman cannot be um, cannot be spoken about highly enough. And here we are in a culture right now where the intention is to take us into a transhumanist future, where the annihilation and the separation between these two beautiful genders is being eliminated. Could you speak on some of those aspects, please? Yeah, sure. Well, one of the things about feminism too is that a lot of it is about it's it's like trying to emulate the the masculine, the part that they're trying to uh, not the the anger and the it's almost like it's it's confusing to the masculine feminine balance within the individual to start with uh, the the element of control and the element of it being planted is is huge you know it's but i also think that that needed to happen because it's us learning about the trickery of the mind and the trickery of of what can happen when we're led astray and i i think we do need to be led astray to understand what being led astray is and we've we're having that experience and oh, but yes. we can move through yeah yeah so i don't see it as so much of a negative i mean we see that it has negative uh, outcomes where men aren't standing up. There's not enough uh, strong men around and, and uh, there's infertility and there's all these uh, issues, but I, I still see it as not necessarily an overly negative thing from a holistic perspective, because you know, it's like, it's like you got to fall over and scrape your knee to realize how to maintain your balance on, on a skateboard or, or you just got to, you got to have some falls. You've got to be led astray to understand what that's like. And then to recognize that when something even, you know, more nefarious comes along and you know what that is now. So the collective experience then becomes wiser. Uh, so yeah, it's just, it's a difficult one because we don't necessarily want to go through it, but the degree to which we'll go through it is the degree to which it's needed, whether we like it or want it or not. So on a higher, from a higher perspective, I think we need to embrace whatever it is that we're going through and that experience, because if we didn't need it, we wouldn't, we just wouldn't be having it. So then if we can take it from that perspective, we can go, well, why, what is it that's missing? What lesson is here for me to learn? And if we can, if we can do that and move beyond what we think is right, wrong, or should and shouldn't be happening, then we can find such power in that. But first of all, we have to recognize and ask and actually be, we need to be that. And it comes from that going, yeah, look, this is, 
how it is for a reason. What is that reason as opposed to resisting it so much? Do you know what I mean? Is it that resistance can create its own issues. So accepting it, but not, not just going accepting, okay, well, I'm here and there's nothing. I'll, that's just the way it is. And I won't do anything about it, but accepting it for the lesson that is there so that we don't have to continue to learn that lesson. And then that's when things will turn around. I think I have a slightly different um, uh, perspective on on some of that, even though I do oh. hold the, you know, that 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 spiritual um, understanding that the yin and the yang are there together. You know, as Jung said, you know, the, the dark side exists with the light side and we can't separate ourselves from that and i believe he even said that um when we don't embrace that dark side it becomes an external event in the world and i've i've often thought about that and thought well perhaps that's what we're exactly seeing but i i do see something extremely evil and it's not of humanity it's 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 something so evil that i can't even fathom it and i've i've been taking time to try and comprehend that psychopathic nature of the evil because mm -hmm. to you know i i used to wonder back you know a couple decades ago i used to wonder why are the herbicides and pesticides estrogenic based I mean, it was just one of those little thoughts in my mind. And now I understand why. Because it is an attack against our men. Because when we do attack their testosterone levels, then they become more feminized. And it, yeah. there's, there's, there's nothing that's not without intention. I mean, I think, you know, I contacted you. That was intention. There was an action you know things don't just kind of happen there's always an intention even even in nature everything is intentional it, from my yeah. perspective so yeah. when we when we see what's happening today with 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 fewer men having the the strength to speak out i mean your presentations are very strong and um the, the self assuredness and 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 your your clarity um, stands out, and and like you say, many are taken down because the censoring does not want this kind of information out. They, you know, the the mainstream media does not want us to be empowered, our men or our women. So, could you talk to how do we actually get? more of us empowered at a time when the censorship is so grand and the assaults continue. Um, well, maybe you could do a, a point by point, you know, like five, yep. five main points of how do we become sovereign? How do we, how do men stand up? How do they become strong like you are? So, it's really interesting the way you brought that up because uh, the first part of trying to fathom this, the level of psychopathy in what goes on in the world, the darker forces and entities that run this realm is that we can't fathom it because we're not it. We're actually completely different from them. Yes. So then that leads to another question. Well, if we're completely different, why do you need to reduce the power of something could be for fun but mostly is because you fear it one of the reasons that men have consistently brought down the power of the feminine over the years is because they fear it one of the reasons that we would cage a beast is because we fear it so to me it's it's hilarious to me it gives me the strength to realize that that the only reason they would try to put estrogenic you know, factors into the, the supply in the world is because they fear us because we're not them, we're different. And that gives me my power and strength, knowing that, knowing that these dark entities are nothing, no match for us that are born of light. And that doesn't mean we're religious or anything spiritual or anything to that degree. It just means that we can't fathom what they do because we're not them. 
We can't fathom drinking the blood of children and, and poisoning people willingly, not just by accident. Oops, we come up with the wrong chemicals. Sorry, guys. Designing it to that degree. We can't fathom that because we wouldn't do it because we're different and we're more powerful than them. That's why I don't have fear about it. It's because I know that. I don't just know it. I feel it. It's not just like I think that. It's I know that. It's, it's beyond a shadow of a doubt. So that's where it comes from. It's not from working on my self-confidence or doing boxing or something like that. That's the element that, uh, that under overrides everything. And so uh, the, the steps people can take to reclaim that is if we, if I could give five things, one would be to spend more time around people in general. Why has this new coronavirus thing, which is just another mask from the same story it's wearing a different mask now, why, why separation? Why social distancing and lockdowns and those kinds of things? Well, they don't want us intermingling. That's where the power is. So being around others and for men, being around other men, you know, you've got to have a passion in life and, and a hobby. Men need hobbies. Men need, mm -hmm. like every man can father a child and, and marry a woman. Doesn't take much skill to do that, right? I mean, unless you're impotent, whatever, but I mean, it takes no skill. Right. So every man beyond working, making a living, raising a family needs a path that is purely his. And a lot of men don't have that anymore. Like it might just be tinkering with engines in, a, in your shed or it might be carpentry or it might be a musical instrument or something or a sport. But a man needs something that is just for him that gives him fire. Without that, he's, he's not there. So being around other men can help that as well. That's, that's the first thing. Second thing is to start cleaning up the diet. You've got to get rid of all estrogenic foods in the diet. And that means I don't like just blanket prescribing diets over the internet because there is no one perfect diet, but it would mean, in my opinion, moving more towards a paleo way of eating. It's a, it's a less estrogenic way to eat. And then watching where it comes from. It's no good eating natural foods if they're laden with pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, or denticides that, as you mentioned, are, are just chock full of xenoestrogens. So we want to make sure it's organic, natural, growing it yourself, hunting yourself, the lost arts. We've gone too far to convenience where things can come from a store and we can make $8 million an hour doing cryptocurrency trading. It's a fake thing. We need to come back to a tangible reality, hands in the soil, feet on the ground and feeling the power of the earth and let that come through us. So getting back to a more natural state, uh, sleep, wake, getting our circadian rhythms in place because our testosterone cycles are linked in like intrinsically to the cycles of the earth. Our men have cycles too. You know, it's not just women that have a menstrual cycle. Men have cycles as to when they're more on heat, so to speak. And when they're less, you know, uh, like fertile, however you want to call it. I mean, we're fertile all the time, but it's just that strength in there that runs on cycles too. So are we staying up too late, too late and not getting enough growth and repair from the before midnight hours? And are we exposing ourselves to too much unnatural light? When's the last time you sat around a fire as a man, you know, and not just around a fire, but with other men as well. So getting back to nature, it's so key. Then you've got the movement side of things. You've got to move your body. We have so many biological pumps in the body that are only activated through movement. A sedentary lifestyle will lead you to becoming less of a man. You must move. That doesn't mean you have to be a champion weightlifter, but you do need to move and move your body through a full range of motion in all planes. Push, pull, twist, rotational, you know, lifting, throwing it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, get Paul Check's book, How to Eat, Move and Be Healthy. And he goes through a lot of that in basic terms in primal pattern movements. You can probably just YouTube his videos and also find primal pattern movements. So you don't need to be an expert at uh, your sport or anything to be able to do that. You just need to move. And then finally is on top of all that, which is the strengthening, is also the ability to soften and the ability to open your heart. And the more we've been repressed in society, just having it being overly emotional and being an effeminate man is not necessarily having an open heart. There's a difference. So an open heart requires having the strength of the man, but with that, 
not being too hardened and having an open heart at the same time, but not being so soft that you're a blubbering mess and you cry anytime a woman cries and you cry anytime you watch a movie and you cry anytime you hear about an injustice in the world. And I'm not putting down men, men can cry. I'm not saying that you don't, but it's just, there's that, you know, what, <laughs> what end of the scale are you on? You got to come to the balance point. And to me, the balance point is having the strength and the robustness in the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, but at the same time, the openness in all of those as well. And that balance point is where I believe this, the full strength of men will come through. So if you were to, um, if you were to um, guide someone today who has been on um, a typical American diet and dealing with uh, alcohol issues, maybe pornographic issues, um, addiction to cell phones, um, and, um, and, 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 a, and an awareness that they're, they really wanna be more than they are, but, but they're, they're lacking the courage. Um, what, where would you start? I mean, uh, what would be the, the first step that, that you would um, offer them? The first step would be to realize that everything you're taught in the mainstream, if you do the exact opposite, you'll be better off. So if the mainstream is telling you to eat a certain way, just invert it, invert whatever they're telling you and then do that. So that's step one, to just get a broad perspective. Second is to start finding mentors that actually are where you think you might like to be. Paul Check, I can recommend to somebody who is a masculine man, but a healthy masculine man. Uh, if you want to learn about, you know, diet and movement and, and you've got nowhere to start, I, that's where I would recommend starting. And not only that, but having a support group. So men need support as much as women need support. And that means surrounding yourself with other guys that want to be on the same track. They don't necessarily have to be further along that path than you, but just that have the same intention. The strength and power of intention is not to be underestimated. So having the right intention of, I accept that I got myself into this place, maybe through innocence, maybe through other means, but I'm here now. So I accept where I am. If I resist or fight it, I create a polarity around it and I can't really move further beyond that polarity because it'll pull me back to it. So I accept where we are. Then from there, make a new decision. Set your sights on something that you want to move towards. Have a dream, have a purpose and a passion in life and let that move you towards it. And surround yourself by others with the same kind of intention. So then you can form groups together where you go and do like cold exposure in the woods, or you'll get together and train and, and learn to lift some rocks, or you'll, uh, you'll learn to, you'll, you'll give each other support in food so the confusion can move away and you'll shop together. You'll make food together, for example, and you'll involve the women as well, because that's an element of it too, especially when it comes to eating well. And then once you've got, the intention right the support group and you've got some mentors whether they're online in books or obviously preferably in your community in the flesh then you can just start to do what men do well which is set tasks and goals and achieve them and feel good about it along the way you know have that that purity of focus and move towards it very fine you know i i in one of your um uh, presentations, you spoke about how you had uh, had to recover from uh, being quite ill. And um, I know for my own, I, many of us have had our own healing crises. And it, it, you know, when we are met with some form of, of adversity, we, we, can, we can hide from that or we can go into it with curiosity and with a passion to understand it. And my experience for my, with, with my own healing crisis is that there was a point at which I, I recognized bedrock. In other words, what I mean by that is I, I understood some very basic information that I could build upon. And, and I realized later that that was paying attention to my own intuitive wisdom, that internal guide that we all have. And, and as a result of that, I healed from a very serious illness that could have killed me. And that brought about the beginning of writing my book, 
because I, I realized that I wasn't unique, that everyone possesses the capacity that I have to heal myself. And, and yet not everyone has reached that bedrock. Now, I know you have because you, you found yourself exploring and bringing your back, yourself back into this incredibly vital, um, healthy place. Can you, can, could you explain how a person can reach that place of knowing? Because today people say, oh, everyone's an expert and how can you really tell, you know, there's this information and that information and, 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 and there's no way to really discern. But there is, through our own beings. Could you maybe analyze that step-by-step -step process of how you figured out and knew intuitively how to make these steps forward and your strong intuitive sense that guides you today? Yes, well, it came through uh, failing and, and going through hard times. <laughs> uh, there's, look, we actually, you know, other cultures have that process of turning a boy into a man and they'll send him out to fend for himself in the woods for a week. It's like, go away. And if you survive and make it back, then in the eyes of everybody, you're a man, you know, and they, everybody is throughout time is needed to go through that uh, trial, that trial of fire, so to speak. And life today, part of what's being put out for us, it's too easy. We actually don't even have to work if we don't want to. We don't even have to go to the shops. We can go on welfare and call delivery and have food delivered to our house and have somebody clean up after us. Life is actually too easy. I mean, it's stress. It's, it's weird because it's also very stressful to operate in. There's too much going on. I get that as well. But at the end of the day, it's been made too easy. The convenience trap has been set and too many of us have fallen into it. And so we're not going through enough trial. Having said that, it creates its own trial because people get despondent and they get, dis they get depressed. Depression is a trial in itself. So everything's going to lead you there eventually. But I think that you can do it much more with more uh, purpose and conviction by actually doing not so passively because that depression trial will come from being passive and apathetic. We want to be more active. That's what men do. We, we, we're active. You know, we, we, we put out, we do work, we create. So then I believe that we should be going more into that line of things and not being afraid of, uh, not being afraid of, you know, learning a lesson the hard way and needing to, needing to push through things, setting challenges that are very challenging and moving through them, learning from them. Uh, pain is something that's unavoidable most of the time. And, and, and so is you know, hard times, but when we move through them, we become stronger as, as a result. So for me, to answer your question, what happened was uh, it, things just got so hard and nobody was helping. I was waiting for external help. Why aren't these doctors helping? Why isn't my previous training helping me get through this training as in learning medicine and natural health and everything else? And it was only when I realized that no one was coming to the rescue that I had to really develop my own sense, my own internal guidance system to know what was being presented to really discern and to be discerning of not only others, but myself. What is it that I'm really feeling? Where is it coming from? Because if I'm lying to myself, then I could have the answer in front of me, but it's not going to solve anything because I'm lying to myself in the first place. So discernment in the self, discernment in what's coming at you. And then you get to pick, you get to really see from a long way off who's got answers and who doesn't and, and where that fits in with you. And are you doing your bit to meet that? Because if you're not doing your bit to meet the either the, the information or the product or the tool or whatever it might be that could help you, then it's not going to help because you needed to meet it. So realistically, to sum all that up, it's just about, it's learning to trust yourself. And you do that by putting yourself in situations that you, that you develop that trust. For example, taking out martial arts. You can't fake it. Jiu-Jitsu, for example, which is like submission, grappling, ground fighting, wrestling. You can't fake anything. You can't pretend you're better than you are. You can't, um, <laughs> you just can't fake anything. You're entirely responsible for defending yourself. And it's not scary either because you learn in an environment that allows you to make mistakes and not get harmed. It's, it's actually a very supportive environment. It's not a combative, fearful place to be, which some people think. 
The other thing that is, is surfing, you can't go out into the ocean and not be 100% responsible for everything you're doing. You have to be in tune with the ocean in the elements and with yourself. And through your experience of making the mistakes and getting ragdolled by waves and running out of breath and then being in the wrong spot several times, you learn to trust yourself and your abilities. We need to develop our abilities in the real world, not doing online courses where you never develop the real world skill. It has to be done in the real world. You need to be able to pick up a tool and know that you can use it. You develop trust in yourself by picking up a shovel or an ax or a hammer and using it and then using it well. And then you know in yourself, I know how to wield an ax. I know how to wield a hammer because I've done it. I've proved it. And I've learned from like hitting the nail wrong or not splitting wood 20 times and, and jarring my shoulder. And then I get it. Now I know how to use an ax. But you can't fake that. You can't do an online course on axe on how to chop wood and never chop the wood. And as it is with any skill. So it's one of the things I think, Kathleen, is that a lot of men have become scared to try and to fail. So we don't take up things like new sports, new activities. Oh, but if I fail at that, everyone will see I'm not a man. You know, I can't go and pick up tools and use it. Everyone will laugh at me if I don't know how to nail wood. Or they'll laugh at me if I go and do jujitsu and I like get tapped out by women. Men fear that. And it's, and that's the thing when men hold themselves back out of their own fear of not being a man in the first place. So kind of have to get over that side of things to just get in there and, and give things a go. And, and you're going to fail at things. You're going to be not great at some things, but part of being a man is to be able to handle that and to move through it to the point where you are capable and I'll just leave it there that you're capable. Okay, very good. So, you know, as we started, you know, this is a conversation about the destruction of our men, but you know, it's a it's a it's a yin and yang. It's we would not be here today if women and men did not evolve together uh, in in unions in, in our societies. Um, do you have any particular suggestions that you might have for women uh, from a supportive perspective for what's going on with this, this crisis among the men? And you know, yeah. what, are, what are our responsibilities that you see from a man's perspective that how we can, how we can actually um, um, present ourselves and, uh, and, and, and help this, this evolution get back into a, into a, a healthy um, sharing and, and, and balance? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, well, thanks for asking because that's a great question. And honestly, I think a lot of women are really on the right track anyway because it's, uh, it's, it's never really been women that's been the problem. It's been, it's been men most of the time through, through history and not really getting ourselves. And one of the things that will completely put a man into his masculine is when a woman is fully in her feminine she, to help create that polarity. And that means being keeping your hearts open. And no, no matter if a man screws up, it, it's like trying not to close off. It's so easy to close off. And then the more we close off, the more we're getting into that, you know, state where we're becoming hard and more like the man. And it, it's, it's too hard for a man to open into that. So by remaining open and having the strength to do that, which is not an easy task because I know women have been persecuted for, for centuries and there's a lot of pain and trauma that's, that's in women as a, as a memory, as a result of that, but still it doesn't, but it's still hardening up because of that doesn't help. So we have to find the strength to, to open up through that. And honestly, a man, when, when he's met, when he's seen for his masculinity and his strength and it's celebrated, you just you'll see what he can do in the world and you'll see how he can step into that and take that responsibility and it comes because there's that polarity between him and the woman the masculine and the feminine and so it's it is really moving away back to some more traditional values as well like don't see it as downplaying yourself to have children and to stay at home with the children and to keep a home that, I don't know when that became seen as like a less than thing to do or not worth the same as being, you know, powerful and having a business and a job like a man. <laughs> like it's not, it's, it's not a powerful thing to do to, to, to be like that. It's a, it's actually 
takes the power away from men as well, but, but particularly women. So getting back to more traditional values and not necessarily naming what that is, like that means you do ironing all day or that means you scrub the kitchen. That's not what it means. But what does that traditional value actually look like and, and really explore that? And this homogenization of society is absolutely by design, as you said. Men are taught to hide their masculinity and become more like women. Women are taught that being extremely feminine is there's no place in the world for it. So they need to become more like men. So then we find ourselves with this gray area of no color in the world where people are confused in that no man's land in the middle. Men have to become men again and women have to become women. It's the only way forward. And the way to inspire a man to be a man is to be very much in your feminine and open your heart to a man, open that femininity and, and, and see what that does for both of you. Well, if not as in just in a relationship, but I mean society as a whole to the point where a lot of people that have gender confusion and sexuality confusion, honestly, I think a lot of that will rectify going back to the proper polarities, not to say that it's wrong to be homosexual. I'm not saying that at all. But I know from my own experience that when men who have become more bi curious or they've become homosexual, for example, when they've cleaned their body and their mind out, they've gone back to being completely heterosexual. So uh, there's a lot to explore in that as well. But at the same time, yeah, it comes back to coming back to who we are and not being afraid to come back to nature because how would we live in nature? That's the question. Without this society, how would we live? And then that's the answer to how we can open ourselves to our masculine and feminine within ourselves. Thank you. So if you were to um, summarize some of the salient points of our conversation today in the last few minutes, where would you put, um, what would you bring out as the, the greatest emphasis, Tom? Is to get back to nature. Uh, on, in all fronts, as a man, as a woman, it's, it just helps to regulate everything. The more in tune you are with nature, which is therefore your nature, the more you're going to get back to how we're meant to function, how we're meant to operate. And what is removed by doing that is confusion. A lot of what people are in today's society is confused, where you'll see people standing around people, someone are getting beaten and knowing it's wrong, but being confused about what to do. Oh, uh, well, uh, you know, what do I do? Is it wrong for me to get involved? But back in the day, that wouldn't have happened in the first place because anybody disrespecting a woman, for example, in a crowd of people, that wouldn't happen because the mob would just go, <laughs> yoink, you're not doing that. And they would probably end up a bloody mess. So they wouldn't do it in the first place. Whereas we're confused now. Do we do it? Is that against the law? Will I get in trouble? Uh, will I even be able to do anything? I'll do nothing. We're confused. That a man will, will not show his true uh, nature to a woman because he's confused. Is that disrespectful? Will she be put off? He's confused. And, some, and women are sometimes confused too. They want to be open. They want to be in their feminine, but they're like, oh, will he just take advantage of that? Or will he disrespect me? Will, what will happen? We're confused. So that when we get back to nature and our nature, the confusion goes away and that opens doors on every level. So that's to sum up, that's for me is what it is, is get back to nature. Well, it certainly makes the most sense to me as well. Uh, and, and well, well stated. And um, I know my, I think my, my greatest centering has come from living in nature. I'm in a box canyon in a wilderness area. And, you know, today there were turkeys in the meadow and last night a herd of elk and the songbirds are, are coming, you know, in, in great numbers. And, and, and the grasses and the, are growing and the blossoms are blossoming and the bees are humming. And, you know, it's, it's just a glorious orchestration of life. And to be a part of that just, you know, is, is so magnificent. And it, it reminds me and makes me feel magnificent in the glory of the magnificence of nature. So, and I, I, I think bottom line, when we really truly understand how magnificent the human being is and we celebrate that we we truly stand in our power and um i thank you for the conversation and did did you have any any websites that you'd like to announce or last statements and 
It's been a great conversation. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've got, well, I've got my own website, tombarnett.tv. I've got that because a lot of my stuff gets pulled off of YouTube and uh, I'm not sure I'll even be around much longer. I'm on a 30 day ban from Facebook and uh, that's likely to turn into a deleted account fairly soon. And so that's where everything's compiled and everything that I couldn't put on public channels is on there. So if you want to find all my past material that's been deleted, it's all on the site. Very good. And um, any closing remarks? Just to remember who we are. It's really simple. It's not a matter of learning new things. As I said earlier, it's just remembering. And if you, if you can't remember, if you have no recollection, it's actually in your blood. The lineage of our forefathers who weren't emasculated, who had to toil and had to fight to get us to where we are today, that still pulses through our veins. So if we just feel our blood, we can tap into that memory that goes back past, present, future and, and, and connects us to the warrior spirit that we did come from. Thank you, Tom Barnett. It's fabulous. I appreciate your time. You're and welcome. Your Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Oh, um, <clears throat> honestly, uh, for the first time since I got back, I've, I found something that I'm good at. And today, someone decided to take that away from me. Based on what? Nothing, really. Hurt feelings, lies. Are you going to do something about it? Well, there's nothing I can do. Just have to see how it all plays out. You're just going to roll over and let it happen? Well, one of the first things I learned in basic was at a time of war, you take the fight to your enemy. You can't sit around clicking your heels waiting for unreasonable people to become reasonable because they never will. You have to take the fight to your enemy.
Oh, um, <clears throat> honestly, uh, for the first time since I got back, I've I found something that I'm good at. And today, someone decided to take that away from me. Based on what? Nothing, really. Hurt feelings, lies. Are you going to do something about it? Well, there's nothing I can do. Just have to see how it all plays out. You're just going to roll over and let it happen? Well, one of the first things I learned in basic was at a time of war, you take the fight to your enemy. You can't sit around clicking your heels waiting for unreasonable people to become reasonable because they never will. You have to take the fight to your enemy.